So I'm more than happy uh, for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, and again, I wait one second. So I'm um, representing multiple hats here today. Uh, very proud to be part of uh, uh, Clalit uh, and the Ben Gurion University, a faculty member uh, of this uh, excellent medical school and uh, health uh, sciences faculty. And I will be speaking here today, giving um, you know a, a more general uh, assessment of some of the uh, threats and opportunities in an era of AI-driven healthcare. And so. Health systems around the world understand today that they have an uncomfortable option. Actually, they've got two options here on the screen and they have to choose. And you know, some of them would not necessarily prefer the first um, because healthcare industries are traditional and they're weary of uh, changes and for good reasons because they've failed many times. But things are changing and they're changing quickly. And nowadays we know that every two days we create as much information as we did from the beginning of time until 2003. That's including all of the books in the uh, Library of Congress. And all of this data is now, actually now it's less than two days because this is constantly increasing in pace. The um, saving this data is also improving. And, and as you see, it's, at some point there's a halt in our ability to store more and more data on smaller and smaller chips, but they're making new advances uh, in, in ways in which can probably uh, hold all the data on a single chip that is going to be increase dramatically our ability to store data and to do more and more of the big data approaches that we have. And the assessment today says that um, it's probably within a few years that almost every decision that mankind makes is going to be informed by a cognitive system. And we are going to lose some of our capabilities in this process. And this brings opportunities but also threats. And so with this new era and those bold new op options, there's also new and, and very serious threats. And they are actually, there is an evolving scale of what these threats look like. The first is privacy breaches. The second is ways in which healthcare organizations can be harmed. And the last is in the options in which people can actually be physically harmed by some of these threats. And we'll try to briefly today look at some of these options and how we can tackle them. First and foremost is the issue of privacy. And we, we very much uh, you know, care about our privacy and the privacy of our data. And what is more private than our health healthcare data? The most intimate uh, notions that between us and our physicians that we don't want people to know about. And actually, uh, when we look at the market today, if you're in the market of selling information, the best thing you can sell, the most appropriate thing in terms of costs, is probably healthcare data. And there are several reasons you can see here why. Um, you know, if I have a credit card number and there's a problem, I can change it. I can't change my medical records in retrospect. I can't alter my identity. Um, and I can influence and I can gain money in many different ways by using healthcare data. So they're worth a lot of money in the black market. And when there's dem demand, uh, there's also supply. And so people are worried, patients are worried. 75% of patients are saving, they're worried or very worried about this. Uh, and they have a good reason. <coughs> in the past years, since 2009, we've seen a constant increase in the amount of leakage of private data uh, into the black market and into the hands of the wrong people. And that was true slowly, slowly gathering until 2015, and 2015 it kind of blew up. Because uh, in one year we could see um, the number of reported breaches constantly increasing, getting to a point of, of 100 million and then um, uh, these are only the things that are reported and the numbers are going up. So that means that one in every three US citizen personal data has already been compromised in 2015. We have here um, uh, the, the specialists for uh, information security of Clalit and they can tell you, uh, it's, you probably can tell the people how many attacks Clalit has on its private uh, medical records every day. There's attempts on the data every single day. And so um, if we take a look at the American system, we are supposed to be better protected, but the risk is very real. If you'll go to the US Department of Health and Human Services, the HHS website, you'll be surprised to find uh, the breach portal, where you can actually see each and every breach reported, and you can see it online. You can see uh, when it happened, what kind of breach it was, uh, was it a theft, was it a loss, Every laptop that was lost that contains data appears on an online server that you can just go in. I mean, you can say whatever you want about the American system and its transparency, but this is 
quite amazing. Everything we are trying to hide, they put out in the open. And I think that transparency has very important because um, th this has value. Now, we always think about people um, getting into our health data and the way to do this is by hacking into our computers. But you've heard just now about some of the hacking. Not only that, I, I'm not sure you are aware, but some of the devices we use in our hospitals can be hacked to steal our data. Not, we'll talk later about trying to get them in order to change how they, they function. But they can actually be used to steal data. So you can uh, steal data from this infusion machine, personal data about the person. We'll talk about hacking it in a second, but this is something that you need to take into account. So this is maybe the first level of uh, threat that we have. And this threat is, is very real and it has serious implications and, and protecting against it is becoming uh, a, a tougher and tougher uh, endeavor for private organizations, uh, for people and uh, for countries basically. Think about all the blackmails you can use this data for on private people, uh, public figures and private people. So this is very serious. Next level is uh, harming healthcare organizations and let's talk a little bit about that. So um, this issue of stealing data can be also used to uh, harm the organization. It has an actual loss and costs in money for the health organization more than almost any other industry and it's going up. And there are new ways in which uh, cyber threats can um, have an impact on how a health organization acts. Anybody here heard of ransomware? No. Okay, so uh, um, some people that do not, this is a very simple thing. One, w one day you wake up, you open your computer, and the computer has like this a little s blue screen that tells you, do you like your, med your files on this computer? Do you like all of your Word documents, the pictures of your kids, and everything else? If you ever want to have access to it ever again, you have 36 hours. And if in 36 hours you do not transfer this amount of money, this will be uh, locked forever. And you don't, there's no way that you can dis uh, uncode or open uh, th this, this uh, um, uh, the data on this computer. And if you have backed, you did backup of your computer to a single domain and you've done this after you were inflicted, all of your backups are locked in parallel. So good luck. How many here would pay? I would pay. I don't know about you, I would pay. Uh, and people pay. You know why you don't hear about it? Because everyone pays. Very few people go and, and seek help from the, uh, uh, you know, from um, police. Can you imagine the Israeli police doing something proactive to help you? <laughs> no, you're not laughing. No, they, 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 they can try, but we all understand they have challenges in meeting some of these very sophisticated people working from very different countries. So if they can't protect your house after a burglary, how, of, how likely is it that they will be able to find those people in Angola that just hacked your computer and, and, and locked all your files and, rec and, and want ransom? So, you know, there's, there's challenge here. And this is inflicting a lot of damage on private people, but also institutions. And if you can see here, who is the top affected industry on ransomware? Would you guess? Medical. Medical, healthcare. So again, uh, think about a hospital that all of its uh, patient files have just been locked. Think about a healthcare insurer that had all of its uh, patient files hacked. Think about, I don't know, the IMA, getting all of its personal files locked tomorrow morning and they want ransom. They say you have 36 hours. You want to get smart? You want to wait this time? That's fine. You'll never see those files again. So people pay. And this is a very successful industry. It does better than many of the things you guys are doing. So, you know, I don't know. Think about this. Um, and there are some examples where this goes to the media and many examples where this doesn't get to the media because they want to close this thing silently because they don't want it to impact their uh, reputation, and they pay. And um, uh, the only problem where it gets to the media is that when it, you know, they pay and it doesn't get open. And then they're really pissed off. But other than that, you know, that happens all the time. So in this case, um, it was hit, and uh, they paid, and it was still got locked. So that's where it gets to the media and people are angry. Where, what about this contract that we've had? Um, so, so this is a problem. But otherwise, a wonderfully working industry today. Now, this is one way to cause patient harm, and every one of you have heard about the denial of service 
attacks that people have, denial of service. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Davidson has presented the new website of Soroka and the new apps that they have. It is pretty simple. You don't need to be a very good hacker to do denial of service on any of these. And if this is part of your daily service, it's pretty easy to get it down. And so, uh, so if the website of the hospital goes down, nothing really bad happens. We'll get it back in, in, in 24 hours. But if it's the chameleon system, that goes down because of denial of service. Now, that's a, a, a more sensitive issue. And as the more we, will be, we are dependent on some of these uh, electronic or medical record systems, they are more vulnerable and they will impact our daily work. But this is still the easy part. Until now, we have touched upon the impact on privacy, which is you know, uncomfortable, and the impact on a health organization that is costly and maybe a loss of reputation. But there might be loss of people's lives. And there are various ways in which this loss of people's lives can happen. We've heard a little bit now, uh, thank you Amos for this brilliant presentation of how uh, cardiac uh, devices can be hacked. But nowadays everything is connected to everything. Your refrigerator is connected to your TV that's connected to your car, that's connected to your cell phone. Um, and every one of these is an opening for someone to come in and play with everything else. They have made an experiment, and I'm sure some of you have read about it, that they've put a new uh, security camera in, in, a, in a place, and they tried to see how long would it take before it's hacked. And it took, what, minutes? There are crawlers around the web looking for IP addresses of security cameras that are not protected. And within a matter of minutes, they start recording everything there. Maybe there will be something valuable at some point. So this is true about cameras. You can imagine this is also true for insulin pumps. Once they're connected, there will be people looking out for them and looking for an opportunity to use them in any way possible. Um, and one of the things that we know that people can do today is they can hack into devices and make use of them for uh, various practices. For instance, this is a very famous experiment that was done in which uh, one of the uh, uh, most famous car entrepreneurs, uh, 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 car companies, have created a car with a lot of connectivity and two hackers were driving by this car and they were hacking into the system and it started by them changing the radio level and then starting pressing the brakes and eventually they also you know uh, caused the car to move to the side rails and um, this can be done with a car now imagine the time of autonomous driving which we are very close to and imagine your kids going in a driverless car to school and suddenly all the buttons go down and you get a phone call would you like to see your kids again you don't have 36 hours, you have 30 minutes. And if you don't pay, the car will go down the cliff. Who's, who's going to be brave and not pay? Okay, so, so if they can do this to cars, uh, why shouldn't they do it to insulin pumps, basically? And how long will it take before they hijack every single piece of equipment you have in every hospital? And, and you know, we have a lot of more of um, um, devices that are interconnected that can be used for this purpose. I've heard a beautiful story recently about one of those, you know, the Fitbits that, that record everything. So this, that, this is very innocent, right? What, what can you do with a Fitbit? Uh, the best applications I've heard so far was about a person who holds this and plays poker, and you can find out when he's bluffing by hacking into it. <laughs> So this is a really nice application for, uh, for hacking. So think about that for a second. And so, uh, and, but, but that's the Fitbit. What can you do with the, with the defibrillator we've heard? And what can you do with the medical re records by hacking and changing the information? Changing your information about your, uh, for instance, uh, sensitivity and, and allergies. What you can do just by a simple change there and how we can harm patients' lives. And we've seen a lot of this. So everybody's been talking for a few years now about uh, the directly hackable hospital devices, insulin pumps, um, laboratory equipment. You can mess with laboratory outcomes. That's also very impactful, right? Uh, and we've heard about Dick Cheney and his defibrillator. Um, and it is very interesting, and I'll get back to it in a second. So all, everything that I've said about now is still the past generation threats. And where we're going to see the real threats is when we understand how healthcare is going to change. And the healthcare we're giving today is not the healthcare of tomorrow, and actually almost not today. A lot of things are now changing. Um, deep learning and artificial intelligence is becoming a critical part of every industry. 
Um, there's a lot of improvement that happened in 2015 and in a single month several breakthroughs were made that were all very interesting uh, from computers being able to write rap songs and ly lyrics to cooking uh, to, the, to, to being able to identify art better than the art experts. For instance, computer vision has since 2015 won uh, 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 the ability of the eyes to, to identify a picture. We are now, uh, it's now official in the ImageNet and, and the other competitions, computers are seeing better than us. And they're playing, and, and you know, everything here is okay. The thing that broke my spirit is again, that even without the Fitbits, today artificial intelligence cheats in poker better than humans. And, and this was supposed to be our last stand, right? This is the, I mean, we, may, they can do anything, but we can still play better poker. So that is not no longer the case. Computers play better poker than humans. So with this understanding, healthcare is also changing. There's new data sources coming into play. Uh, we are collecting health-related information from our beds, from our carpets, from our toilets. Um, I don't know, but, but these are actually, think about it, instead of going giving a urine test, why go give a urine test if you can just, you know, go to your own bathroom and when you flush, the bathroom tells you, good day, did you know that you're pregnant? Yeah. So if this sounds unusual, this is actually something that is feasible. And as, if you're a man, male, that, that's a bigger problem. But if, <laughs> generally speaking, 70% of the American people said they'll be happy to put these things in their uh, toilets. So uh, who here would put something like this in his toilet? Uh, again, the same three people. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Um, but Google is also creating a contact lens that will be able to take your um, blood chemistry levels on a continuous basis, every single second. And all of this data is going to st be streamed uh, into their computers and going to be used to improve your healthcare. But imagine the threats and the risks. Now, there's also a whole set of new data sources that's very difficult for the human eye to read, okay? So you can read your ECGs, you can read your, your MRIs. Uh, it's very hard to take your genome and read it, okay? You need help there. There's, there's a limit to what you can do. And, and genomes are just the beginning. We're going way past genome to a new, interesting ways of looking at whatever we have in, in our bodies, and the prices go down. Um, and, and we can't do it alone. This is where the point in which we, you know, we raise our hand and we default. We need the help of computers and artificial intelligence and we use it all the time. Now, I don't know if you think of artificial intelligence and you think about you know, science fiction movies, but artificial intelligence is part of your life every day. Okay? And the real uh, world setting is that if today in making our uh, clinical decision making we take into account five facts on average, we're going very quickly to a point in time in which we'll have to take into account thousands of facts in order to make a single decision in healthcare. Uh, who here can process in their head, uh, in the five minutes you get to see your patient, a thousand different pieces of information and correlate them together to make a decision? Not even the same three, nobody. Okay, so that's true because that's probably not possible, but that's going to be the main state of healthcare. So, this brings a new potential type of threat in. Um, everything that we do about diagnostics is going to change. We are not going to be you know, holding an x-ray and looking at it and trying to make a diagnosis that doesn't make sense in an era where computers see better than humans. And I'll give one example that was just released to the press two days ago. So uh, in our work with uh, uh, a, a local startup company, we've been able to uh, see within uh, CTs things that human eyes cannot see. So you can look at this vertebra and understand that this patient has osteoporosis. Anybody here who can see the osteoporosis in this vertebra? I can't, but the computers can. So imagine how many more hidden values there are in this image that we can look into. And in the future, we can't hope that our radiologists will be looking at the picture and telling us what's there, even with the pucks and the wreaths. So, I mean, humans cannot do this. We'll have to trust machines. As we trust machines more and more, the risks become higher. Another field we are very much involved in is, is the issue of predictive, preventive care. We are making decisions today more and more based on intricate data points. In Clalit, for instance, um, we are trying to see who is going to have the need for dialysis five years from now. 
And we have a predictive model that takes into account a lot of different data points and figure out who's going to be at risk five years from now. So we can uh, target the treatment to those specific patients. And you can proactively approach those patients and treat them early on. This is something that the human eye or the human brain cannot do, but the computers can, and we've been doing it now for four years. Identifying these patients, proactively approaching them, and trying to prevent their deterioration pathways despite their higher risk. It's called preventive nephrology, and it's in every clinic in Clalit, and it's happening, and we're not publicizing it because it's part of our mainstay treatment. And we're doing this for several other diseases as well. We are doing predictive modeling for diabetes, and we're doing predictive modeling for um, elderly at risk, and we're doing a lot of these types of efforts, and they are becoming part of our mainstay in what we do and what is unique about the care that we're trying to give. We're trying to move from reactive therapeutics to proactive prevention. Now, all of this is very much dependent on being able to analyze a lot of data very quickly and to do advanced research and take this research in from bench to bedside very quickly. And we pride ourselves for being able to do that. But again, this makes us much more dependent on the computer for decision making. The future is going for artificial intelligence dictating for us what pathway we'll take for treatment, not only for prevention. For instance, have it, has it happened to you that you bought something in Amazon and then a day later they sent you an email and said, would you be interested in, and they offered you something. You said, oh my God, how did they know? That, I, I mean, I, I bought something for a bicycle and then they offered me a blue dress. How did they know to offer me a blue dress? The, the, the answer is they don't. They have no understanding of why people who buy bicycles then are interested in blue dresses. But they know that this is in fact the case. And they have a set of recommendations, today recommendations for you. Because they know everything about you. And they know that people like you, that made decisions like you, two days later, took a decision to buy this and this product and they offer it now to you in a very interesting manner without understanding anything about this psychological process that made it happen. Why do people who di buy diapers la later buy beer? They do not know. But they know that's the case and if that's the case, that's the proposition they're going to give you. Healthcare is going there. This is where healthcare is going. You will have a decision support that will tell you that I don't know why this patient uh, patients of this kind react better to this type of treatment, but this is the fact that happened for the last thousand patients like this, so this is what you should prescribe. This is frightening for doctors. We are used to understanding everything. We learned seven, at least six years understanding the pathophysiological mechanisms, and we want to be able to chart all of the different process and understand why this drug that we're giving, which enzyme it stops, and why it's fit this patient. How can we use black boxes? in guiding our decisions. This takes all of the humanity for our work. Everything we've learned, everything we've been educated on. Uh, do we have any edge after all of these uh, worked years if this is the way we choose our therapy? This is really, really disheartening. But this is where it's going. And this is only a partial list and there's a whole set of applications that's data driven that's going to change healthcare. And at Clalit, we are uh, actively involved in each and every one of these and we are actively pursuing them and we're making them into a reality. And, and, and the world considers what we're doing as a, a really a prime example for, for other uh, nations and other organizations to choose, including our, our very intensive work with the World Health Organization that uses us, at least the Clalit Research Institute, as its worldwide excellent center on this type of work. And so we try to do this, but there's a risk here because we are overriding our judgment. And once we start overriding our judgment, our ability to stop those uh, changes in the data are becoming uh, more problematic. Has it occurred to any one of you that you were trying to get home or trying to get somewhere in ways told you take right here? And he said, what are you talking about? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm be, I've been driving this for, for years. I'm not taking a right. I mean, I'm, I'm the, the best way is going straight. How many of you have taken right when ways told you so and, and despite your best judgment and your previous experience? How many of you have done that? Um, I, I did. At the beginning, I resisted. I swear to God, I tried. <laughs> After I was stuck two times in a, you know, the worst traffic jam from hell, I stopped trusting my judgment and started trusting the machine. And if I did this on the thing that is really simple, very few pieces of information, the way home, which I do every single day, what is the likelihood I will override the computer decision support in a decision that takes into account a thousand different pieces of information? 
I will tell you in five years, zero. And those who will, will be sued for this insane decision to override the decision support system. So, who's going to protect us from malfunctioning of this decision support? And this is where virtual reality and true reality start to blend in a way that is going to transform healthcare for the better and the risks for the worse. And this is where we're going. We're losing the, intu the intuition, protective barrier as providers. And this puts us in harm's way. And so my not so bold prediction says that a time will come, and it's not going to take many years, where virtual viruses will cost more lives than biological viruses. Because it's all going to be interweaven, and it's going to be very, very challenging. And since that's where we're going, we are now in a new era, and there's a new challenge here for all of us sitting here today. We're the startup nation. Best talents in this field are centered here, in, the, in southern Israel, the best faculties involved in researching this domain, um, all of the best startups and the most brilliant minds trained in the best uh, uh, establishments, and the hospitals that can serve as the platform to test drive these new lines, frontiers of, of defense. And this is where it all should happen. And I hope this is where this will indeed happen. And so, when we look at the future, I think that one of the things we should take into account is how do we fight back. And the national, um, uh, the national strategy for cyber, for those of you who read some of the, what, what they write, talk about three levels of protection. Robustness, resilience, and defense. With robustness being more of the passive protection against the threats, kind of like how our, our skin protects us from, from invasion. And there's a, a resilience where we will have adaptive uh, approaches to protect ourselves from within. And defense go to what happens outside of our body. It's, it's what the state can do to, to attack the attackers before they come in and to prevent this in a very active way. And I think this is where cyber is going. And what we should do is start taking back from healthcare to cyber. Why? Because we know how this works. We know how viruses work. We know how the body protects itself from viruses. We've been doing it for years. We've been researching it for years. It's the same thing. Basically, immunology could be one of the key, uh, I would say, inspirations for cybersecurity. The protection mechanisms should be adapt adaptive, mutation-based, proactive, just like our human body doesn't wait for an event to happen to have all of its mechanism ready. And this type of approach, uh, it requires some ingenuity and some innovation and some risk taking, which I think all exist in this place. We have all of these basic uh, uh, knowledge domains in one place and, and these should be harnessed. And I think again, we can be a beacon for all the rest of the world in how this should be done. My final note on this issue is that in an era where computers become decision makers, and when this is how the physician's room is going to look like. <laughs> um, the most important technology is still going to be, at the very end, empathy. And that cannot be cyber attacks. Thank you so much. Thank you.